Hello, my lovelies. I'm Ginny O, the author with no last name. And this is the fifth and hopefully final part of a series called It's Easy to Blame the Writers for Everything Bad that Comes Out of Hollywood. And we are continuing the portion of the arguments I've been seeing of the writing is just bad. <laughs> So, in the previous video, I talked about um, how subjective that bad writing arguments are, kind of thing. Um, so, we discussed, or I discussed, how they, how a lot of arguments, how some of the arguments, sorry, are um, Things like, we want real villains, or they've ruined the franchise with a new installment, or uh, you know, they don't like the themes of some of this stuff, or there's too many reboots and adaptations, and you know, so on and so forth. So, <sighs> None of this is really, you know, quote-unquote bad writing. This is just stuff people don't like and, you know, they like... Or they don't feel like they're it's meeting their expectations or something like that. So because they don't like it, they call it bad. Alright. And so another argument I've seen about, you know, the writing in Hollywood is just bad and we need to get rid of all these writers and get in new writers who, you know, are good writers, is that, um, <sighs> there's too much drama in these IP franchises, or even, boys don't like drama, boys like action, but they're praising Oppenheimer. Please make it make sense. Uh, once again, as usual, we're mostly talking about fantasy or science fiction IP, and I focus on this because I love action movies and fantasy and sci-fi. It makes up the bulk of my movie collection and uh, my book collection and my writing, and <laughs> lo and behold, I'm female. I, I just can't get away from that. So. Um, <laughs> And this kind of putting it into this restrictive gender thing, I, it just drives me crazy. But the argument is kind of, you know, boys love action and girls love drama, and it's kind of just bunk. This goes back to my statement about people are kind of allergic to nuance and context of things like representation and socialization. And, Boys and girls do play with toys differently due to those factors. And so uh, I believe somebody used like this Lego type of study. And they threw it in a lot of context. So I don't know, you know, how old the kids were or what their demographics were or whatever. And so they gave the boys and the girls, um, they both gave them Lego Batman sets. And the boys played with Lego Batman, and he was Batman, and he was awesome. And the girls, you know, tossed Batman away and did other things. And, look, okay. I didn't play with Lego as a kid very much. I mean, I had some knockoff Legos, but I didn't play with Legos very much. Um, I liked Lingen Logs a little better. That was just mean. I did have Barbie. But, um, so, let's say you gave me a Lego set. Really, Lego sets were not a thing when I was a kid. So, you gave me Batman Lego. Where's Batgirl? Where's Batwoman? Where is Harley Quinn and Poison Ivy? <laughs> Batman? <laughs> I prefer Catwoman. Talia Al Ghul. Batman can stay in the Batcave. Give me the Oracle. I mean, unless it's Terry McGinnis. I mean, he had a cool design. He was cute. I liked Robin and Batman forever, but he was a teenager, not a kid. So, boys like boy power, you know, their representation, Batman, Robin, Nighthawk, 
that type of thing. But girls like girl power. They want Batgirl. They want Catwoman. They want you know, Batwoman. They want the Oracle. Wow! Go figure! I, I don't want to play with He-Man. I want to play with She-Ra! <laughs> I want to play Cammy and Street Fighter. Laura Croft, yes! Princess Leia and Padme are badass! We had our moments! You know, when you are thinking about, you know, representation and the socialization and the way that boys and girls play with with dolls. G.I. Joe's are dolls. I know action figure dolls, but they're still dolls. If you give a girl a superhero doll that is a superhero wren like the Black Widow or Catwoman, it's more likely that she is going to play Catwoman stealing things or Batgirl, you know, coming in, swooping in, and saving the day, and stopping Catwoman from stealing things. Or maybe she's gonna do Poison Ivy and Hi Harley Quinn having a relationship. I don't know. I don't care. <laughs> But it's more likely they'll play with the dolls in the canonical format when they can see themselves represent themselves and their gender with that toy. You give them Batman, yes, they're just going to look at Batman and throw Batman in the cave because to them Batman is boring. Uh, you know, maybe you don't like the little girl's perception of your Gary Stu here, but that's the way it is. So. You know, they, you know, so they're saying that the girls took the Legos and they played drama. They played house with the Legos because, you know, they didn't like Batman. Well, see, it's the same thing. He, he became Ken. We don't care about Ken. Ken's not doing cool things. We want to see ourselves doing cool things. It is a human need. So, you know, so they're saying, well, boys don't like drama. Well, let's really think about these sci-fi and fantasy franchises, you know, they're, that they're saying there's too much trauma in these sci-fi and fantasy franchises. They, most of them aren't actually action franchises. Action franchises. Mission Impossible. The Bourne series. James Bond. One of my faves. The Expendables. Indiana Jones could fall under action. Transformers has been kind of made into action. Okay? Those are action movies. Action movies are made in a specific way. John Wick movies are made in a specific way. Uh, Shoot 'em Up was made in a specific way. Taken movies are made in a specific way. Mr. and Mrs. Smith was made to be a action movie meets rom-com. Same with the kill with killers. There, that has a specific genre and a specific format. Star Wars, Star Trek, Firefly, Stargate, Battlestar Galactica, Supernatural, Game of Thrones, The Witcher, Sons of Anarchy, Good Omens, Sandman, Dune, and Alas Marvel are all dramas. Big epic arcs, major factions warring against each other, personal feuds, romance, big ass dramas. Yes, okay, you have an action set scene in them from, you know, time to time. There are lightsaber fights in Star Wars. Star Trek has their, like, their spaceships all zooming around and firing at each other and, you know, shooting phasers at the aliens. And <laughs> Firefly, you were doing crime and having shootouts. and <laughs> Yes, they had action set pieces, but they did not actually equate them into being action franchises. They are drama. They are space operas, space westerns, you know. Big fantasy, epic, high fantasy. Willow is a drama. Like, you took Willow, once you took Willow out of the movie thing, it became a drama, okay? Um, some of them should have been planned better. Star Wars, MCU, cough, cough. Uh, but it doesn't make the core franchise stop being a drama. 
I'll also like Chronicles of Narnia is about being about sibling family drama, if you think about it overly much. And it's a lot more fun if you think about it as a family drama. Um, Lost in Space was family drama for the robot in, in Evil Savator. You know, if Fables, the comic book, ever got an adaptation, it'd be a drama. So sometimes I'm sitting here wondering, are we even watching the same things? These things that they're claiming that have too much drama in them, like, I don't know, I don't know if they're like, him, the Witcher has too much drama or not enough drama. I think the Witcher probably suffered from a great deal of restraint on the actors and directors and showrunners part and the writers and a great deal of you're only doing six episodes to do books that are, I don't know, I gotta say, they're probably thicker than this. They gotta be thicker than that. I don't think they're George R. R. Martin thick, but they're pretty thick. You know, when you, yeah. Like, if you tried to fit this whole book into six episodes, come on, you can't do it. That's ridiculous. So, <sighs> saying boys and men don't like drama. Sons of Anarchy is like the manliest man of shows that I can think of. It, you know, biker gangs going up against uh, Nazi skinheads going up against um, gangs out of Compton, going up against other biker gangs of uh, different races, getting into arms dealing and having to go to Ireland. Um, there was there was a whole arc with the baby. There was the whole arc with the prison. There was the... It's a drama. Men ate this up. I mean, the first four seasons were all character driven drama. <laughs> season five and six and six, uh, seven, the first half of seven, that was all kind of mindless shooting and the violence got out of control before going back to character driven drama at the last half end of the season. But like, I would talk to, I you know, I talked to a couple people who were watching it, you know, men who were watching it, who were like, you've watched Sons of Anarchy? Yes, I watched Sons of Anarchy, what are you doing? And they're like, I don't see why they couldn't continue the story. They had all the characters and everything. Why won't they continue? You know, it was like, it was like a soap opera for manly men. <laughs> and I mean, like Supernatural, you know, that is framed as a very manly show. You know, two guys fighting monsters. It, it was in drama. Um, X-Files, drama. Like, it's like, I, I, I just, are we watching the same things? Yes, you know, yes. And it's kind of reductive to say, you know, girls don't like shoot 'em ups, you know? Maybe we'd like shoot 'em ups if we got to see Padme shooting up more people or, you know, River Tam. I, I remember there was this whole thing for a while after Serenity came out. I was like, all we want is a, uh, is a movie like Shoot 'em Up where River Tam just goes after everybody. <laughs> you know? um, let's take like Mad Max. Mad Max is like a modern restaurant, and restaurants can be very dramatic, you know, slow but dramatic um, type of thing. And so. <sighs> Just because it's a drama, just because we're adding in epic scopes and personal relationships and warring factions and um, you know, politics, House of Dragon, Game of Thrones, <laughs> The Witcher, it doesn't mean it's bad right? Now, you know, we can have some really bad execution of an adaptation, which I think The Witcher is having a unfortunate bad execution problem, but the writer got $21 million, so he's happy. <laughs> I mean, in watching the discourse, it's definitely been a popcorn moment. <laughs> you know. So, you know, so then we continue kind of like this reductive type of argument of man versus women. I don't think stories should be reduced to that type of reductive argument, but here we are. Um, so the it, then we come up um, to my favorite. 
we don't hate strong women, we hate bad writing. Once again, remember, bad writing is subjective to be absolutely meaningless. And, you know, say, this also comes off as, this movie didn't cater to my specific wants, needs, and tastes, and therefore, I don't like it. So, you know, they're comparing things like Captain Marvel to Edge of Tomorrow, you know, it, it, so on and so forth. Or, in, in, there's a corollary to this one, too. Um, female action stars are too strong. It's not realistic. I'm not watching The Princess for realism. I'm watching to watch this girl go from the top of a tower to the bottom of a tower and beat everybody up. That's why I'm watching. <laughs> I wanted realism. No, I don't usually want realism. When I pop in a movie, I want something to entertain me. And if, you know, that is my power fantasy of watching a girl go after a whole bunch of people and, you know, be on the, That's what I want. You know, the double standard here to me is kind of mind-boggling because you know, some of these same people who are going to be arguing they don't like Captain Marvel or they don't like Cara Dune or they don't like the princess because they're too strong females. Females can't do that. Sure, okay. <laughs> um, they are going to praise a movie or a movie franchise like John Wick. I bought all three. I bought the three John Wick movies in a little package and I decided to watch them. Kind of back to back. Might have been a mistake. And I'm sitting here watching and I'm going, he ought to be dead. No, he's dead now. He's dead now. How many times can this guy be hit by a car and still be alive? You know, so it's not that the overall story in, is bad in John Wick. It, or, you know, and in my opinion, you know, some of the action scenes needed to be edited down, like, by 10, 20 minutes, or be giving me some sort of personal stake instead of going after uh, assassin number 550. I, I don't know why we're going after them. John doesn't seem to have any personal relationship to them, and they're not doing much more than standing in the way. Is this really necessary? <laughs> From, and that was like movie two onward. The first movie was pretty well edited and pretty well constructed and had pretty good motivations. And I was just like, this is a pretty decent action movie. I still like shoot em up better, but this is, you know, or I like the Expendables better, but this is a decent action movie. I maybe would watch it again. But like, you see these people going, you know, we. We don't like this movie because we've seen it with a, you know, already in the action movie genre, you know, person goes to get revenge against somebody for killing somebody else or kidnapping somebody else or killing the dog. And so one movie gets praise and the other movie gets pr criticism for the exact same plot line that's been retread in action movies I don't know how many times at this point. Because it's a very common theme in action movies, you know, the get revenge theme. And the only difference between each of these movies is the gender of the lead. So if a male action hero does it, it's great, it's wonderful. It's, you know, it doesn't matter that the physics don't matter and that he would be dead a hundred million times. But if a female action hero does it, the movie is awful, it's horrible, it's been done, it's a retread, blah, this is so boring, can't they come up with anything new? <laughs> is this bad writing? Or is it just you don't like it because you either don't like the gender of the lead or you don't like, you know, I don't know, something, is there's something else about it you don't like or the, the female just doesn't you know, act the way you want them to act or expect them to act. That was the problem with Captain Marvel that I saw. A lot of people didn't think that Captain Marvel, that Brie Larson was, you know, portraying Captain Marvel in the way they wanted Captain Marvel to be portrayed. And then you saw a lot of 
reviews and a lot of people coming out, a lot of women especially coming out going, I felt that the message of the movie resonated with me because, you know, I get told to smile all the time. You know, I get told my emotions are too much all the time and that I, you know, need to, I need to shed this kind of need for approval from other people or from men type of thing. If you don't... So is it bad writing or was it just the message was not for you type of thing? Um, and, it, and it comes back to this part where the studios are trying to get butts in the seats and trying to get people to come and watch movies. You know, Laura Croft was like, oh, we can kind of get, we can get people Mr. and Mrs. Smith were like, we can get women to come and watch action movies if they, you know, have somebody like Angelina Jolie in it, you know. So it's taken a long time for them to be like, there can be female action stars that don't have to rely on having a whole bunch of males behind them as part of the crew to carry a movie. So, uh, you know. And sometimes I wonder, is, is, is this just for clicks, too? Sometimes, it, is it just for clicks? It's hard to say. And is this reaction that they're having that it's bad just to get clicks for the algorithm? So, uh, I just took back to the library a couple days ago a book that if I was a 30-year-old woman having an identity crisis, maybe it would resonate more with me. It was a perfectly fine book. The writing was fine, you know, there was enough characters, there's enough questions going on that, you know, I would have kept turning pages, whatever. I just wasn't the audience for it. I really wasn't feeling it. Like, I was getting the message, the message was coming through loud and clear, which some people would say is bad writing, but sometimes I feel like you have to hit people upside the head with boards, so, you know, <laughs> whatever. And but I didn't need that message. Like, I didn't... It, and just because it wasn't tailored to me or my expectations or my particular needs for a cozy book with rich craft in it, doesn't mean it was a bad book. It was not a bad book. It was, you know, well written enough. And... But and if I had been at that time in my life where, you know, I was having this kind of identity crisis of who am I without being in a relationship, you know... I probably would have you know, been devouring it or whatever, but you know, I learned that lesson all the way back in my 20s, like a long time ago. But someone, not me, might need to read this book and, and see and feel that message and, and that's okay. That's great. You know, I don't go in there and, you know, I don't pick up a lot of books with expectations anymore. Like mostly I look at covers and titles, I don't even, you know, I try to find ones that don't have time travel in them or zombies. Those are kind of like my two things. I don't I don't want to deal with time travel and I don't want to deal with zombies. But otherwise, you know, I'm looking for, you know, this is this is is it science fiction or fantasy? Does the you know, does the premise sound you know, is the book cover the cover okay, the the title funny, does the premise sound remotely interesting? I try not to come in with any expectations, but if it doesn't meet my expectations, it doesn't mean it's necessarily a badly written book. Maybe it's just, I didn't need that message. Or maybe it's, okay, I think it personally needs editing, but, you know, that's just me. Other people might like it better. You know, other people might like it the way it is. But, <laughs> you know, um, not just take the book back. You know, find another book. I don't try to go out on the internet and like scream about how bad the publishing industry, all the bad writing in the publishing industry. Um, you know, maybe I come to the internet and scream about the lack of editing in the publishing industry, but not you know necessarily the bad writing um, type of thing. And yes, there are some truly probably badly written things out there, like Light Lark, for God's sakes. <laughs> the story of Light Lark, you know, how it even got published is like insane. But like, so, 
you know, we've kind of come back to full circle here. You know, what I was saying in the very beginning about about the creator versus the the audience, you know, Barbie and Captain Marvel and whatever divisive female-led story coming to your mind are not going to resonate with every single person in the world. And that's okay. It's not bad writing. It's specifically targeted writing to get a certain audience and maybe hook or open the eyes of a broader audience, which in fact makes it good writing. By the way, if you hooked that target audience and the target audience that you were getting it going for got the message, then you did your job. If the, uh, you know, so, I mean, I think Captain Marvel had good writing because it was going for a targeted group of people to get that audience of females into the seats to watch an MCU movie, and maybe if they see Captain Marvel, they'll want to go back and watch Iron Man. Or they'll come see more Marvel movies, you know, where Captain Marvel's in them, you know. That is, there's like the Marvels is coming up next. I think it looks funny, but I don't, you know, whatever. I don't like it doesn't mean it's bad necessarily, okay? Making nuanced antagonists isn't bad writing. Writing drama is not bad writing. Drama is juicy. If there's like not a personal stake or emotion in the bang bang shooting, it will get dull fast. Wish fulfillment female action characters isn't bad writing. Writing that doesn't cater to you specifically isn't bad writing. So, I mean, it's easy to blame writers. Even though we should be blaming CEOs and corporations and producers and marketing teams. Because writers cannot write well under the constraints they're currently under. There are things the CEOs and marketing teams are telling them to do and things that are completely out of their hands and control and they don't like it either. But the power is in the hands of the CEOs and corporations and, you know, who are paying or rather not paying their the writer's bills. And fans are somehow believing writers are psychic or something and forcing or forcing expectations onto a product before it's even out and then crying foul at the writers even though they're not, you know, behind every the scenes thing. Because even if they know, okay, I'm sorry, scripting was a little weird. So even if you're like a super fan and you're following everything behind the scene and you got all the director's cuts and you're listening to all the, the, uh, the way the people are talking, the commentaries and everything, and you know what's going on, like, you know the action scenes are being sent out to VFX, and you know that the scripts are being changed mid thing, and you know that the um, actors are only getting partial scripts, or they're working in green rooms against without any other actors, you know, then you know the constraints, and you still blame the writers, you know, and directors, and even the actors dealing with it, instead of blaming the CEOs, it's, that's a real toxic problem. And it, I know it's so easy just to blame the writers, but, you know, the CEOs are the ones who end up making these massive decisions. So, some, I guess, would like to watch an entire industry fall apart, an entire profession be destroyed at the seams because there are, in opinion, some bad writers. It's like we're saying we want all doctors to stop treating people because this specific doctor is bad at their job. That's not how the world works. So, you know, if the, and I hope the writers have gotten by this point, because, you know, five weeks since I've recorded this, gotten a deal, you know, if they're not under so much stress, if they're not under, you know, so much anxiety, they could put out better work if they're not under the constraints, you know. The corporations and CEOs and the producers, they can change direction at any time. They can stop, you know, being beholden to the stockholders. They can stop making, you know, they can stop saying, though, oh, we need 25 million a year plus stock options plus of this bonus or whatever. You know, they can change direction and, and pay the people that are making their 50, 25 to 50 million dollar a year paycheck possible, the pennies that they're asking for, you know, pennies in comparison to like the small, tiny fractions of percentage of the overall profits. 
I mean, they can pay them out of their bonuses and it would not affect their lifestyles. So this is how little actors and writers are making and how little they're asking for. Union Strong. So, it's easy to blame the writers. And you know, sure, there are going to be times when writers miss the mark. And yet, whenever I go to these interviews that the writers and that the directors and the showrunners are giving, what am I seeing and, you know, and what the writers are telling us? What am I seeing is they are under such a massive constraint. They are under a massive amount of stress. They can't make enough to, you know, keep their houses. They can't make enough to make the minimum to get their health insurance. You know, they're they're constantly moving from job to job as they get tried to be turned into a gig economy. And it's not them doing this. You know, they can only redo their contract every three years, and they're trying to redo a contract from the 1960s. And every single time that the technology changes, the corporations and the studios try to screw the writers and the actors and the directors over. So we have to go, they have to go on strike every single time VHS comes out, DVD comes out, Blu-ray comes out, streaming comes out. This is like clockwork. So corporations are not your friends. Blame the writers, blame the corporations. You can do this for traditional publishing too because they're not hiring the editors they need. They're not, you know, they're not giving as many passes. They're not giving as much marketing to things that can need the marketing. So um, we might be talking about that next week. Anyways, I know it's easy to blame the writers, but please put your ire where it belongs on CEOs corporations, producers, the people with the power to the, who are paying the writers, who the writers have to please in order to keep their jobs. Take care of yourselves, my lovelies. Um, this wasn't really an argument. This was just some, you know, a lot of observations I found fascinating. So stay safe, bless, and I'll see you in the next video.